Let's get started by thanking our wonderful sponsors who make this show possible every week. We can't thank them enough. Age-Related Macular Degeneration, or AMD, is the leading cause of adult vision loss in the U.S. It affects 1 in 14 over the age of 40. When caught early, there is time to take corrective action. Ask your eye doctor to test your dark adaptation speed using the Adapt DX Pro from Maculogics. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gill, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Please visit the film's website at openyoureyes2020.com, featuring interviews with more than 50 optometrists from around the country, sharing information on eye care and eye disease. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Macular degeneration, or AMD, is a leading cause of blindness in the US over the age of 55. More people have AMD than breast and prostate cancer, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Finding patients at risk of this blinding disease then implementing proper diet, supplementation and lifestyle changes has shown to slow or possibly halt the progression of this blinding disease. Today's guest, Johnstown, Pennsylvania based optometrist, Dr. Greg Caldwell is a giant in the science of advanced technology to help in the early diagnosis and prevention of retinal disease. Dr. Caldwell lectures both nationally and internationally. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Caldwell. Well, <clears throat> truly a pleasure to be here. And uh, I might have to take you on the road with me. The word giant, I'm not sure so much about that, but uh, thank you for the nice accolade there, Carrie. Well, I appreciate that. And it's great that really is great to have you. You're one of my favorite lecturers. I really am on the edge of my seat when you're speaking. So I wanna start off with, when I went to optometry school, we use an ophthalmoscope and we could see about a hundred microns. If we saw a drusen, we would intervene. As the years have gone on and rapidly of late, technology has really advanced. And now we could see down to 10 microns, soon to be one micron with some technology. But the recommendations, our recommendations in a lot of, in medicine, a lot of it is cookbook and the recommendations don't catch up to the new technology. So do we have to wait till we see a lot of drusen or a lot of disease before we make a recommendation for prevention? Same with like diabetes where we'll see, now we can see with OCT angiography, and we're gonna talk about that, capillary dropout before there's any bleeding. Are we waiting too long to make recommendations to our patients? Yeah, that's a great, great observation. and. And I've been from the podium, you know, I'll say that, you know, we were taught those macro changes, right? We were talked about, you know, like when you mentioned diabetic retinopathy, cotton wool spots, dot and blot hemorrhages, those are the macro changes and things of with technology now, advances in technology allow us to see these micro changes. Getting back to your topic on macular degeneration, you know, if we're waiting for drusen to occur, um, I think we're really missing the boat on this. And you mentioned, you know, 10 microns, you know, with spectral domain and some of these OCT instruments, we're getting down to, you know, five to six microns of resolution. And then, you know, with staying with, you know, uh, macular degeneration, you have OCTA angiography, we have that in the practice. And then on top of it, you have dark adaptation, uh, which is an instrument. There's only one company out there. So Maculogix has that with dark adaptation. And that's moving into functional testing where, you know, where cholesterol is building up into the, into Brooks membrane, where we can't even see that with that, you know, five to six microns of resolution. So 
technology is definitely uh, uh, outpacing, I guess, some of the diagnosing or some of the traditional macro changes that we have to wait for. I remember being taught like, oh, patient 65, they have a family history of macular degeneration. Oh, you don't have to worry about that because the drusen don't show up till 65. Well, that's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. You know, we're, we're missing the whole the early diagnosis part. So uh, uh, definitely technology is out there, uh, is outpacing maybe some of our thinking. So what exactly is macular degeneration and what are drusen that we see inside the retina that are early signs of macular degeneration? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, you know, the, the macula is the part of the eye that helps us to get that detailed vision. So, you know, I tell the patient that's what, you know, tells the E from the F, the O from the G. You know, it's a small percentage of the retina, but it's a huge part of the retina because that's what allows us whenever you know, I'm looking straight ahead and trying to get detailed vision and my side vision doesn't have that detailed vision, that macula, it just says the word, you know, says it starts to, to degenerate or break down or not function. Um, so it's the center part of the retina. It's about 5.5 millimeters in size. And through inflammation, through byproducts, through metabolism, uh, just garbage builds up and that's what drusen are nothing more than garbage. And then your body has in some cases an infla an inflammatory reaction an immune reaction to try to get rid of that body's great at sometimes smart, but then it starts to break down and creates that degeneration, which then the retina, I think, uh, you know, we talked about that macula. It's got two supplies. It's a neurological supply and a blood vessel supply. And it just starts to break down and not function. And we just don't see well anymore uh, in that central vision, which is critical for reading. Uh, so, um, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a terrible disease. I hate to see it with our patients and it certainly outpaces diabetes. You brought up diabetes and diabetes is a huge issue, but macular degeneration is even bigger. So when we look at the cause of macular degeneration, we're looking at inflammation, we're looking at oxidative stress oxidative stress, inflammation being the core component of chronic disease. Can you explain the difference between inflammation, oxidative stress, and how it causes uh, degeneration of the macula? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, a, yeah, it's pretty scientific. I'll try and do my best uh, uh, kind of layman type of, I was speaking from the podium. Um, you know, oxidative stress is just but the biggest word that's out there are free radicals. Free radicals form, and basically that's just an unhappy uh, electron, or it's an unhappy cell that's missing an electron. And that's, that's when they're unhappy, they're just constantly looking to try and, the body likes to be in balance. So it will look for anything that's out there. And if our body is not, you know, and it just comes down to fruits and vegetables and diet, that's what we need to balance out those free radicals if we're not eating properly or our food sources aren't what they used to be because things are grown so fast. Um, the electrons need to balance out. It goes for cells, you know, the cells of the body. And in, in, in this case, macular degeneration, maybe a photoreceptor cell. And the issue with the retina, it's very metabolically active, right? It's constantly capturing light sending images back to our brain and it creates this, you know, a, a big pool of free radicals. And then the photoreceptors are now being damaged to balance out that imbalance because we're not having those fruits and vegetables that are there. And that's kind of that oxidative stress. Inflammation is just kicking in that a whole inflammatory pathway that's out there. And you're hearing about cytokine release that's, that, that's, that's popular right now but you get inflammation and it's kind of more of a negative feedback loop. Once you get to kind of a second stage, oxidative stress leads to oxidative damage. And that's the damage part is more the, in, in the inflammation side of it. And it. Just starts breaking down retinal and retinal vessels, retinal structures and loss of vision. Now the mitochondria is important. Talk about how macular degeneration is a breakdown of mitochondria. Yeah, um, kind of one of my uh, one of my uh, soapboxes right now. When looking at the OCT, 
um, which is an instrument that gets down to microns. You know, there's two types of OCTs right now. I call it the B scan OCT. That's the one that most optometrists have out there. And you're looking at the slices of the retina, almost kind of like layers uh, of the earth. And you have the RPE, which hyperfluoresces. And right above it, this name has changed multiple times. Yeah, they used to call it the inner and outer uh, segments at the photoreceptor integrity line. It's now the ellipsoid zone. So I was doing some digging, you know, teaching about, you know, different structures of the retina, why they hyperfluoresce and hypo. And that ellipsoid zone, which hyperfluoresces, believe it or not, is nothing more than mitochondria, the way they line up. So when you're looking at an OCT and you see the RPE right above it, there's a little dark space in the next line, that photoreceptor integrity line, that outer and inner segment, that ellipsoid zone. I don't like calling it that. When I get into my lectures, I'll explain it. And then the, re the rest of the lecture, I call it the mitochondria zone. And the mitochondria zone is that we all went to school and even in basic biology, high school biology, my son's a senior and he's talking about biology and they're talking about the mitochondria. And those are the powerhouses. And you see those powerhouse, you see that, that ellipsoid zone or what I'm calling that mitochondria line, that whole line, you see it starting to fade in an OCT, though that's not a good sign, even on a good strong signal and people, oh man, that's, that's, you know, that's a bad scan. It's not a bad scan. You need to interpret that as being a latent, that's your oxidative stress. Then when they disappear, that's your oxidative damage. So those mitochondria, you're able to visual, visually see them on an OCT. That ellipsoid zone is what that is. So that's very important in interpretation. And over the last probably six or 12 months, it's kind of been like my soapbox. Quit calling it the ellipsoid zone. It's, it's the mitochondria line. So, so there, we're going to talk about treatment that toward the end, but what kind of supplements can help support the mitochondria? Yeah, so uh, another soapbox that that I'm that I'm getting on is, you know, carotenoids are extremely important. And we need to, you know, be talking about lutein and zeaxanthin. Um, but that's actually if you if you look at an OCT and if you look at all the companies that go out and promote, you know, lutein, zeaxanthin and there's a company that does mesozeaxanthin. If you look at their brochures, and see where that is, that's in the inner retina. So, you know, there's the inner retina, there's the outer retina, and then you got, you know, the choroid. And the inner retina and the outer retina can separate pretty easily on, on uh, based on anatomy, and that's why you'll see lamellar holes. That lutein and zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin is at the inner retina. And that's very important. You need those to capture that blue light. It acts as a sunscreen. It helps sequester those free radicals. But my soapbox that I get on, again, that's my other soapbox during a lecture is, don't we care about the outer retina? The outer retina where that cholesterol is building up, where we just talked about uh, that oxidative stress with that mitochondria. And down in that outer retina, resveratrol, you hear about that in wine. It's a natural antioxidant or it's, a, it's an antioxidant, but it's a natural uh, anti-VEGF. It also supports mitochondria. On top of that, there's another uh, polyphenol or flavonoid, quercetin. And then on top of it, catechins, that's what's in green tea. So those three there, those polyphenols, um, those flavonoids are in the outer retina. And then the inner retina is lutein and zeaxanthin, the highest concentration. And our body allows that to happen because there's some protein binding there. And that's important to have those carotenoids in that inner retina. But I, I think of the photoreceptor, and we talked about those mitochondria. I always like to use analogies. And a few years ago, I was at SECO and I went to the, uh, to the aquarium. And there I learned about brackish water. I'm a guy from Pennsylvania. So I'm not by salt water. I'm not by, a, you know, you know, I'm by, you know, uh, normal water, salt free water, but brackish water is where, you know, salt water and, and clear water go in together and it becomes brackish water. And I kind of think of that mitochondria as that brackish zone. When you look at OCT angiography, you got blood flow above, you got blood flow below. 
There should be no blood flow in the photoreceptors. It needs to get nutrients from below and above. So I really have been a proponent of, you know, especially in the patients that are early or subclinical macular degeneration that you can pick up maybe with dark adaptation, treating them with kind of more of a full supplement rather, again, it's important to have, you know, the carotenoids, but getting something that has like a, uh, a resveratrol, quercetin, or, uh, or, and catechins are all three of those in it. You know, there was a study done not long ago where they took patients and they were examined by, I think, retina specialists. And, and then they took photographs and they showed that about 25% of the patients, they would miss early changes of macular degeneration. Can you explain a little bit about that study? Yeah, I think I'm familiar with the study, and, and it, I believe that study had both uh, optometrists and ophthalmologists in it. Um, it's the same study that we're referencing, because uh, there's a lot of studies out there. It, there was a study that had about, I don't know, about 1,200 eyes in it, so about 600 patients. And what they were doing is just checking the prevalence of macular degeneration. And the signs that they were looking for, they weren't using anything fancy other than, you know, examining the patient, taking a photo, maybe using OCT. Uh, but in, in examining the patient, the summary of it is like the, what was the shock was 25% of the patients in that came back normal. And whenever they did take them and sent them maybe to for a second review that the, the 20, or I'm sorry, not 25% came back normal. 25% came back as that were normal, but really had macular degeneration. So 25% of the people that were missed. And the kicker of that study was if I was in that study, I would have known what they were looking for. It wasn't like, hey, examine this patient and then we're going to have you double checked. Hey, Dr. Caldwell, we're going to want you to be a part of this study. We want you to really look at that macula, that five and a half millimeter by five and a half millimeter zone. We want to see how many people have macular degeneration. And if I was in that study, in a sense, what would happen is I would have missed 25% knowing that's what I was looking for when it went off to the, uh, um, to the, to the reading center to kind of get validation if it was normal or abnormal. Now, the second part of that was of those people that were said to be normal, but then the 25% that had macular degeneration, 30% of those people had large drusen, which then they classified that as intermediate. And then that turned into, which is a huge risk factor to going on to advanced macular degeneration. So you know, the, the, the whole point of that is we might say that there's X percent of macular degeneration out there, but even when you're examining and even knowing that you're looking for it, you could be missing it just on regular examination. I mean, that's really a, a fascinating uh, study. And it, it, it really looks and points to the fact that our technology is getting so much better. And now if we did that study today with better, with better technology and better resolution, I bet we would get better results. So uh, let's talk about the pathogenesis of macular degeneration and the buildup of cholesterol at the level of parts of the retina of the RPE. Why is that cholesterol building up? And what is the cholesterol doing? Is it there to try to protect the retina, but, but having a secondary effect of breaking it down? Why are we producing it? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, why is it depositing it? I guess is, you know, and my question would be the, you know, the, the million dollar question. It's building up in, into that Brooks membrane, right? That's kind of the early uh, pathophysiology. You know, I'm kind of proud being in Pennsylvania. Um, Maculogics is in, in Harrisburg. And so I got to work with, uh, you know, Greg Jackson, the PhD down there. And he's the one that's kind of really spearheaded this by having a family member lose vision and loved ones lose vision. And he kind of put his whole life as a PhD and to try and really track this down. And he found that, you know, one of the earliest stages of, of macular degeneration is cholesterol building up in Brooks membrane. Now that, you know, you ask, is that protective? Probably some way the body's probably trying to deposit that there maybe for its thinking in a positive way, or maybe, you know, it's just deposits there because of a genetic predisposition, but I'm going to take it from the clinic, you know, from the clinic side, since I'm seeing patients, that's not good because you have, we talked about that brackish 
the, the photoreceptor needs to get nutrients. So the choroid is supposed to be supplying vitamin A to the photoreceptor. Vitamin A then takes and gets converted over to like rhodopsin, which is very important chemical for us to dark adapt. So what happens is that vitamin A can't get through that oil slick and gets, can't get there. So that, that's why one of the earliest uh, ways to diagnose macular degeneration is people with having dark adaptation because that vitamin A can't get through that oil slick. So you got the choriocapillaris, you got Brooks membrane, you got the photoreceptor, the RPE and then photoreceptor, that photoreceptor needs that vitamin A to be able to dark adapt. That means going in from like a bright room to walking into a dark room. And I remember that the first time that happened to me and I was like eight years old, I was outside playing and I came inside my mom had a sliding glass door that was tinted. And I remember like being bleached out and then I couldn't see for a while, but I kind of shook my head for a little bit. And, you know, as an eight year old, it took maybe a few seconds and boom, I flipped back over. But in, in someone maybe, 50 and older, that can be maybe a, a first sign that they're having macular degeneration. And with the statistics that are out there, you know, we talk about sensitivity and specificity, sensitivity, sensitivity having the disease. It's about an, and when you when you test on a device, not just by walking in from an outside to inside, but if you test on a device, it has a 91% sensitivity of saying that's, you know, macular degeneration if you're having that. Um, so that cholesterol buildup out there just starts blocking that vitamin A and doesn't allow that rhodopsin to convert over. So a dark adaptation could actually pick up before drusen when that cholesterol starts building up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I literally just did a talk last night down in, in Raleigh, uh, uh, North Carolina. And one of the, you know, you know, trying to to bring some type of awareness to this disease. We don't have to wait to 65. And, you know, one of the comments that I made to the group, cause they were just kind of like staring at me for a little bit. I said, look, if, if you don't want to consider doing our dark adaptation, then in our glaucoma patients, just wait for the visual, wait for that optic nerve to become notched. You know, let's go back to when I went to school and I didn't have G, you know, nerve fiber layer and GCC you know, I was looking at a notch, maybe some stereo disc photos. We didn't have the OCT and we were doing visual fields. We know with technology that we can catch with a structural change with GCC nerve fiber layer glaucoma a little bit earlier. And when you're going with macular degeneration, if you're just waiting for that drusen, you know, you're really missing the boat. That would be like kind of waiting for the notch to appear on the optic nerve before, you know, oh, okay, now we're going to treat you. You can catch it a little bit earlier. You could catch macular degeneration a lot earlier. And we call that, you know, there's a couple new words out there. You know, we call that kind of subclinical macular degeneration where that, where that drusen's building up. And then the OCT angiography has brought us into a whole new technology and a new word of, of non, uh, occult non-exudative cordoneovascular membrane. Age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, is the leading cause of adult vision loss in the U.S. It affects 1 in 14 over the age of 40. When caught early, there is time to take corrective action. Ask your eye doctor to test your dark adaptation speed using the Adapt DX Pro from Maculogix. Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven vision edge. If we look at the staging of macular degeneration, uh, kind of for doctors, but if you look at preclinical to advanced macular degeneration, what do optometrists write in their chart when they're staging macular degeneration, when they're, when they're looking to see who's at risk for going from dry macular degeneration to the wet kind. Of course, patients always come in and say, do I have the good kind or the bad kind? Is, is there a good kind? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that's a great question. And we used to think that the wet was the bad kind, but you know, with these injections, maybe that is the good kind now because at least you can, you know, maybe patients have 80 injections, but maybe they're still 20, 40 or better where the dry, if it's just atrophying away, that can, there's, there's no treatment, uh, at least yet. 
uh, for the geographic atrophy. So, you know, that is such a double-edged sword. To, is, is one good? You know, the key is there, neither one is good. Let's get early detection uh, and, uh, and, and, and hopefully uh, stop this from getting to the uh, advanced stages. So you asked about, you know, what are the, what are the docs putting in the, in the charts? You know, I, I, you know, ICD-10 coding allows us to kind of really break this down. Um, to where, you know, it could be mild, moderate, or severe, you know, maybe they're just doing dry or wet based on that. Um, kind of interesting today, I was working, I'm in a registry, uh, it's an outcome-based registry, we we're looking at some of the data, and it was showing that, and it's, it's optometry data and ophthalmology data, and it was showing that, um, that there's more wet than there was dry, but I'm wondering if they're, you know, in a sense, coding that in, you know, in, in, in that way. Or are we just missing the dry degeneration? Or, or are they just calling it drusen? You know, I think that that's some of the issue is that, that we were taught that, you know, back in the day, well, you could have drusen, but if there's no pigmentary modeling, if there's no true damage, then why would you call it degeneration? So I think there's still some of that thinking that's out there. Even had that question last night. If there's drusen in the retina and there's no vision loss or no structural damage, can you call it macular degeneration? And I think that that might be part of the the awareness that we have to go out there that drusen in the macula in that 5.5 you know, millimeter zone, it's macular degeneration and not drusen. I mean, certainly, I think the patients if they have drusen. I mean, if I have drusen. I want to be on prevention. I don't want to wait till I start losing vision and then start trying to do something about it. You know, even though it may not be, even if it's early drusen or stage one where you have less than 63 microns and it would be considered category one ARADS, you know, I think, I mean, this is my personal opinion. I want to do prevention. You know, if it's myself, my family, my patients, I want to give them the option of prevention. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that's why I have the technology in my practice. I have lots of technologies, um, kind of that the, the later stage, you know, using OCT and geography, using, looking for that, uh, that, that occult non-exudative cortical neovascular membrane. Um, I just started a really cool technology um, that is preferential hyperacuity perimetry. Um, where you're able to send a device to the patient's house. And again, you're looking for that intermediate dry patient. They're using a mouse looking in kind of, a, I hate to say it, but it's kind of an easy way to think about it. And AMSR grid on steroids, but it's nowhere close to an AMSR grid. It's, it's this line that's bent and it's again, preferential hyperacuity perimetry, looking for that early detection of choroidal neovascular membrane. So that's kind of like at that end. So OCTA and uh, preferential uh, hyperacuity perimetry. And then my one of my best ways to get patients into the practice, I see a lot of patients and my retinologist doesn't have OCT angiography because they really don't need it. And I guess in a sense, if you want to say that, because they're seeing more of the end stages, we as optometry are trying to catch this early. So OCT angiography is you know, is beautiful. But where I'm going with this is I'm seeing a patient in the, in the, uh, in the chair and they have 43 injections in their right eye. And I'm really monitoring their left eye closely, maybe using the uh, preferential hyperacuity perimetry, doing OCTA, looking for any early cortical neovascular membranes. But what I like to do is just pause and, and when I'm doing that exam and turn around and say, oh, it looks like you have someone with you. Oh yeah, that's my son, that's my daughter. And that's the person that I wanna say, okay, what are you doing so you don't end up in this condition? And they might look at it and go, you know, I, nothing. Um, I'm told that it's a disease of, of aging and you know, usually they're closer to that 45 or 50. If mom's in the chair and they're 75 or 80, I'm like, you're prime. You know, we can do things. We can do dark adaptation. Um, I have a scanner at the, at that measures the carotenoids in the skin. I've been doing that for now for about, oh, probably a year, maybe nine months to a year. It, it's able to measure at a very high accuracy. It's been correlated to serum, which is correlated to macular pigment. 
And you talk about a lie detector of nutrition and just a way to start opening up the conversation. That has been really good, but it's really that person that brings in. Now, sometimes it's a spouse, right? Sometimes it's a husband or, or, you know, if it's, you know, vice versa, if the husband's in the chair, sometimes it's a wife, but a lot of times it's the, a family member. That's the person that I want to start working on at that point. And we can start doing things and it goes back to smoking, diet, nutrition, the, the systemic diseases, obesity, um, you know, proper supplementation, uh, getting them into some type of you know, sunglasses, the, the blue light from the sun is, is, is bad. And then we have blue light coming off of the computer monitors. You know, if you're in front of a computer monitor for a short period of time, probably not a huge issue, but then if you're cumulatively in front of it, that could build up. So there's that blue light that's out there. You know, and the other part, I guess, of, of, of treating macular degeneration would be if they did have some vision loss, um, then you can get them a low vision exam. I think my low vision friends would be mad at me if I didn't bring that up as part of a treatment. And then, um, and I think a lot of, you know, a lot of patients and colleagues don't realize that increased frequency of exams using this technology that we have, whether it's OCTA or this, this uh, hyperacuity perimeter that I was talking to you about, or, you know, scanning or, or doing dark adaptation, more frequently or earlier, knowing how to interpret catching the disease. So more frequent exams is definitely, or observation is definitely part of that treatment. So let's talk about choroidal neovascularization. Before somebody gets wet macular degeneration, with OCTA, we could see these occult membranes. Talk about that and what happens when we find one. Yeah, that's, you know, that's been a trick. Um, you, so a choroidal neovascular membrane is just a result of that inflammation that we talked about earlier, oxidative stress. Um, we talked about inflammation and really you're starting to get a breakdown in that RPE. So when I talk to the patients and I say to them, look, it's like getting cracks in your sidewalk. You have this layer of RPE, retinal pigmented epithelium in the back of the eye that starts to break down. And on an OCT, that's those hyper, hyper reflective columns that I try to teach that that's breaking down the RPE because that coherent light is able to get through. That would be like the crack in the sidewalk, which now with the inflammation in the body trying to heal, the body creates blood vessels. Then they kind of grow up through those cracks. And it's like having cracks in your sidewalk and uh, you get some seeds in there of weeds or grass and the grass begins to grow, but you don't want the grass growing in your sidewalk or the weeds. So you come back with some Roundup and you spray it and you kill it and you go, okay, everything's perfect. Um, but you still have the cracks in the sidewalk. So more seeds over time fall into the cracks and it grows back up through. So the roundup in that whole analogy would be kind of like the VEGF injections, the anti-VEGF, the, the, the Avastins, the Lucentis that you go to the, the, the retinologist or the ophthalmologist, they inject it into the eye, it kills that membrane, but the crack is still there. And that allows the, those choroidal neovascular membranes to keep reoccurring and reoccurring. But the body's trying to heal itself. It had damage from the inflammation. It had damage from the drusen. And you have cracks now. And the body's trying to say, hey, I'm going to try and repair these cracks. But those blood vessels are not good because they bleed at times. And it creates a big hemorrhage and then scarring and more loss of vision. So... Um, you know, the body sometimes tries to help itself, but in that case, when it bleeds, it's not a good outcome. There's some predictors that we can look at when the doctor is looking at the retina. What are some things that we could see to show that, okay, this person's at risk for getting advanced disease, such as geographic atrophy or the bleeding, the wet type of macular degeneration? Yes. So the, the risks really come out and that I'm thinking of in, in my mind of it, with this question real quick off the top of my head would be maybe the, the risk factors that we would see on an, on an OCT. Yeah. That's that, that's that, in, that's that device that's able to see the different layers at that five to six microns that we talked about that inner and outer retina. And a lot of that, uh, those predictive factors are kind of in that outer retina where that disease is, right? The cholesterol has built up. 
It's blocking nutrients. There's stress to that RPE. There's drusen. There's inflammation. So one of the, you know, there's probably about five or six that are, uh, that are listed, but the two that I love teaching from the podium are those hyperreflective columns. When that RPE starts to break down, and that RPE is a nice, thick, retinal, pigmented, dark, black, it'll absorb that coherent light. But when that RPE starts to break down, it will allow that coherent light to go through. So one of my pearls that I like to teach when interpreting OCT is I love looking at the choroid and seeing if you're seeing those little columns of light. I have pictures that I've take, taken from driving out here on the way home because I'm not in sunny Florida. I'm in, you know, in cloudy Pennsylvania from time to time. And what happens is the cloud bank will build up, but then you get a little thin layer and you get that little ray of sunlight that comes down through. That's kind of that same thought process when that RPE is breaking down and that coherent light is going through. That's called a hyperreflective column. Now there's also a hyperreflective uh, hyper foci, focus. And that's usually right above the RPE, right where we're talking about that ellipsoid zone, where you get this spot of hyper little ball, a hyperreflective foci. That's what when we look in the back of the eye with our camera or take a picture or, or use a 78, you'd start seeing that as being an RPE scar. Again, a sign of inflammation, a sign of progression. And then there's other things like uh, reticular pseudodrusen. Those aren't below the RPE like you get with a drusenoid PED. They're more above the RPE. They're kind of pointed. You get some nascent geographic atrophy that can occur. And so the point of that is, is what I try to, to, when I teach OCT is that if you see an OCT and you take an image, what you want to do is you want to look at the next image that was taken six to nine months later and see if you're seeing those hyper reflective foci. They weren't here before. Now they're here. Progression. We talked about oxidative stress, inflammation. We're moving into that degenerative, this macular degeneration part. If you're seeing those no hyperreflective foci, you know, one or two years ago, now they're forming, it's advancing. We need to be maybe trying to do something, helping this patient out. You know, again, smoking is, is one of those terrible ones. Easy to say to quit doing uh, or tell the patient, but man, what a bad habit to try and break. And then all the other things that we talked about, systemic diseases, proper supplementation, sunglasses, but they're progressing. And if you don't stop it, they're going to keep moving on and either have geographic atrophy and a, a lot of vision loss that nothing could be done, or they're going to get that cortical neovascular membrane that we chatted about. Now, the patients sometimes have early symptoms of problems with night vision. Can you talk about the importance of that? Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. And that's where we moved into that, that, that night vision. We used to blame it on cataracts, but cataracts mainly makes an issue with glare, right? Like you go outside at night and a car headlight comes and you have a cataract, it'll act like a, a, a lampshade on a, on a lamp. It will cause the light to scatter and then you can't see real well. Well, that's more glare. When you go from a, a, a bright room and you walk into a dark room or, you know, it has to have some light, I guess, you know, walking into a, a cave, you're not gonna be able to see, but you get what I'm saying, going in from a bright outside to walking inside and you're really switching kind of, in a sense, photoreceptors, you're going from cones maybe to rods. And that's that whole part about the rod intercept and that vitamin A that we were talking about. When you ha start having a delay in that happening, that is when that could be one of the earliest signs of macular degeneration. So I told you that story about when I was eight years old and I ran from outside, it was a bright sunny day, ran inside, closed the door. I was like, oh, I can't see for a second. And I waited and yeah, it wasn't that long. It might've just been 10 seconds and I kind of flipped over. I dark adapted. I was able to now use that other photoreceptor. Someone that's in their 50s and if they can remember, hey, that happened to me when I was 50, but man, it's taking a lot longer now for that to happen. That could be one of the first signs of macular degeneration. 
not cataracts, right? Not cataracts. But there's other diseases out there that could be part of that, right? Someone could have some liver issues. That's where vitamin A is stored and then released. But they would probably know if they're having some liver issues. And then there's a condition in the eye called retinitis pigmentosa. That might cause some dark adapting issues. But you're going to be able to look at that retina. It's going to have very specific findings. Little These little black areas that are called bone spicules um, that are out there. So... Uh, uh, so, you know, dark adaptation uh, is pretty important in the early onset and diagnosis of macular degeneration. Let's talk about risk factors for macular degeneration. And back in the, before 1900, there was almost no macular degeneration. And then our diet changed and 63% of the food that we eat is processed food. And now macular degeneration, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diseases that were almost non-existent before 1900 are exploding. I think the first cardiologist was maybe in 1930 uh, because since our diet has changed and, and our lifestyle has changed. So what are some important uh, risk factors to you? High glycemic foods, alcohol, blue light, uh, having the big belly, the metabolic syndrome. What do you find as some very important risk factors? Yeah, I mean, well, you... You kind of hit them all. I'm not sure what, what I can add to that list, but uh, you know, you have, if you just listen to the name age-related macular degeneration, obviously age as we get older, you know, you hear about modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So obviously, you know, that's good thing. Age is happening. We're, we're, we're going from fifties into our sixties into our seventies. And obviously that is a risk factor, but that's good that we're getting older. And then our genes is another one. We can't really change our genes, but yeah, you're right. All these, you know, okay, blue light, you know, the sun, the sun has been around for all those decades that you were talking about in those centuries before, but what has really changed is our diets. You know, I was reading something the other day, uh, I really have getting into nutrition really based upon one I should uh, as a doc but it was about three or four years ago where my patients were challenging me about, doc, I need help with supplementation. And so I started jumping into that and reading about it. And I, I'm like, oh, Greg, I'm pretty well connected. I know people like Carrie and, you know, and all these other docs that are out there, Jeff Gerson and all these people that I can go and reference. And it was like unearthing a tree. Every time I would dig something up or thought I had something, I found it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this isn't as easy as it, as it's going to be. But, you know, it comes down to, Carrie, you hit it. Um, you know, you talked about processed foods. That's not good. You know, I heard someone say, you know, as soon as you start going up and down the aisles, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Stick to the outside where the fruits and vegetables are. You know, in, in if I kind of think of a grocery store, okay, there's maybe that bacon and hot dog section, skip that. But then if you go over, there's kind of that seafood section. And then you're getting into, you know, your yogurts and, and all the kind of the natural products. But as soon as you start going up and down those aisles, that could be getting pretty bad. And th there's some good things in the aisles, but you're getting the point of staying away from those processed foods. You talked about being overweight. You know, one of the things that I didn't, you know, really realize until I connect the dots, I love having those aha moments is, you know, you know, fat cells are living organisms and they produce byproducts, right? So, and they need to live. So if I'm eating some fruits and vegetables and my, I'm a little overweight and my fat is producing free radicals and putting stresses and my body can never get caught up on those few fruits and vegetables that are being, uh, that, um, that I'm eating. And then on top of that, where I was going, where I was talking about reading uh, something the other day about in 1953, it was, it's kind of floating around. I've seen it on social media and so on and so forth, but I got to the article and I read about it. You know, it takes, it takes 21 oranges today to make the same nutrient value from like 1953. And, you know, the food that we're getting, you know, the, these chemicals, we keep talking about carotenoids and polyphenols and flavonoids. Those are, those are chemicals that make like kale green and marigolds, you know, the beautiful colors. It's what makes the world beautiful, all these carotenoids and their fat loving substances. 
and our body cannot produce them. And I think that's the key that we I really want to point out now is our body can't produce them and we have to take them in through fruits and vegetables. And then on top of it, you know, the fruits and vegetables that are grown nowadays, they're grown so fast. I was speaking to, you know, one of the uh, scientists that make nutraceuticals and he just said to me, hey, Greg, you want to get two cups of spinach and eat them. Two are from Canada, two are from Scottsdale, Arizona. Which one do you think you'd want to eat? I'm like, I don't know. Um, he's like, well, just pick one. And I said, okay, Canada. He's like, okay, you're right. And he goes, now why? I said, well, I didn't know who to begin with. I just picked one. He just happened to pick Canada. And he was like, well, the, 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 the days are shorter in Canada. So it's in the ground a little bit longer. And those chemicals are there to kind of protect the plant so longer growing, a little bit more nutrient dense. And he goes, and then what happens? And I'm, you know, maybe Scottsdale produces, I don't wanna get in trouble by saying Scottsdale doesn't produce high density uh, spinach. But the point that he was pointing out is that you can have two cups of spinach and it can be totally different. Just the way they're grown, fast, sourced uh, and brought to market. So the foods just aren't as nutrient dense. So. Uh, that's one of the, I think we got into how the risk factors and that was a long drawn out way to, to answer that. So. And how about alcohol? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> alcohol is just another one of those stressors, you know, multiple free radicals, inflammation. Um, you know, every, you know, it's, it's like everything, everything is moderation in life, right? So you just got to be moderate with it. So I'm not going to say don't ever drink alcohol, but it's certainly not good. It has a high caloric, uh, uh, part of it, which leads to the obesity. Um, the alcohol can then break down cells. Um, you know, so I guess, you know, if you're going to maybe drink something, maybe drink that glass of wine, right? Because it has resveratrol in it, but you don't want to drink too much to try and get to all your levels of resveratrol. And we know that alcohol de depletes zinc and thiamine and vitamin A. And these are things that are very important for the, not only the body, but for the eye. Yeah, that's why alcohol yeah. de increases the risk of, of macular degeneration. And you talked about spinach before, and it reminds me of a study where 1950 compared today, you need 50, like 53 bowls of spinach for, for the same nutrients as one bowl of spinach in 1950. So it's really, uh, you know, it's a tangled web we weave and, you know, we have to really be mindful. Uh, are we getting the proper nutrition? Yeah. And I want to feed off of what you just said there, because, you know, you said that so nicely and about how it depletes your, you know, the, the alcohol depletes all the thiamine and vitamin A and the zinc. But that's exactly what happens when people smoke. People want to know why, why smoking is so bad. Your body triages, you know, it's, it's one of the best way to think of what the body does. So let me just say that I think I have a good diet and I'm you know, eating an orange and I'm eating spinach salads. And then I decide to go smoke a cigarette. Well, you're doing, you're trying your body, you're trying to get those natural uh, carotenoids and flavonoids and polyphenols. And, you know, we, we have a lot of, you know, internal ways to produce free radicals and external ways, which is sunlight would be a good external way. Breathing produces it. And we took in a few of those antioxidants that we talked about. Your body triages and it always tries to go and puts it in the proper place. As soon as you smoke that cigarette, that is like the, you know, all that's a, that's a five alarm fire. And your body just says, send all those. And it just, that's how it depletes your antioxidants. That's why it's just so bad. And it just triages and tries to fix all those bad chemicals coming in. And I'm not, you know, faulting anyone out there to smoker and that could be listening to this. I understand that it's a, you know, it's a terrible addictive disease or a habit, not a disease, but a habit. Um, so I feel for you. And that's why I always try to support and get as many people that want to quit smoking as much support as they can. I remember reading a study. If a doctor tells people to stop smoking, all they have to do is tell them to stop smoking. 10% will stop smoking, but 90% can't. Yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, let's go back to the technology because you're such an expert in technology. We did talk a little bit about, about it. Let's talk about uh, retinal imaging, just regular fundus photography and fundus autofluorescence. I had a very interesting patient, unfortunately, today who was a child and 
he's been to a few different ophthalmologists and, you know, he has high cylinder and his best vision is about 2040. And now at 11 years old, we should really be able to correct him better than 2040. We should be closer to, he's been wearing glasses for years. He should be closer to 2020, maybe 2025. And just the way he was reading the letters, it was just different. And then, you know, if you look at the retina, it looks okay. But when you looked at fundus autofluorescence, it was a sign of cone dystrophy. And uh, so what's, explain fundus autofluorescence, how it could help us and a fundus photography in general, something that we use quite a bit in eye care. Yeah, so, you know, you know fundus photography, pretty straightforward. You're, you're taking, you know, just a fundus photo and, and evaluating it and you can do different magnifications. You can change, you know, to red free, you can change the, the color on it and really help you get some di diagnostic skills or get some increased diagnosis, depending on how you can, in a sense, say, manipulate the photo. You know, fundus autofluorescence, you know, I'll, I'll know enough to be dangerous here to, to talk about it, is that you know, it's more or less, we talked about that RPE level. And when that RPE level, you know, as RPE starts to break down, it leaks out chemicals that when you hit it with the light, it will, without using fluorescence, you know, injecting fluorescein dye, the light and the chemicals that are leaking out because the RPE is dying will then autofluoresce. And so that just allows you again to when you're trying to solve a mystery, just like you that you showed, uh, is that it will autofluoresce. Now the key to that is, is that as the disease process goes uh, and, uh, progresses along, and the RPE cells are not leaking, the autofluorescence will go away. So it's kind of in a sense you caught it in its kind of dying phase whenever it's happening. So, but it can be very, uh, very useful in diagnosing uh, some of these conditions that are out there. This kind of, as you mentioned with your, with your patient. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.